So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Lori George and I am with the, the University of Illinois Extension Office. I am a small farms local foods educator in the Mount Vernon area. Uh, today, James Thury and I will be talking about no-till gardening uh, for small acreage. Um, and so to get started, I will just go ahead and let James introduce himself. Hi, James. Hi there, thank you for the opening remarks there. My name is James Theory. I am with the University of Illinois Extension. I am a local food system, small farms educator based in Kankakee, Will and Grande counties. For those of you that don't know those counties, they are just Cola counties of Cook County, which is Chicago. Should I, should I get going? Okay. All right. So I get this going, uh, this uh, class going. And uh, at the very outset, I want to say that there is not much of research that has been done on no till in small acreage. We do have quite a bit of information when it comes to large field, you know, field operations. But when it comes to small scale, and by small scale, I mean five acres and less, there isn't much out there. But there's one very nice uh, reference, which I'll give you at the end of the talk or through the talk, which I will ask and urge everyone to listen to. But to begin this uh, class then, I would say if you desire a no-till garden, like you're seeing in the pictures in front of you, where there are very few weeds and very low maintenance and possibly high yields, then a no-till garden is the way to go. So as you can see in these gardens displayed here, a perfect no-till garden is not only nice, aesthetically pleasant to look at, it's also weed-free and incredibly productive. And I hope that you'll see this possibility at the end of or during this presentation. The garden that's on the top left there, you can see a few weeds in between the beds. And that's just because Unlike the other two gardens, there isn't any mulch. And mulch, we shall see, is a very important part of no-till gardening. So, in large-scale agriculture, no-till is considered a great advancement. In conventional agriculture, the earth is turned over several inches deep and it may be followed by one or two diskins. And as we shall see in this presentation, this is destructive. Or another word we shall be using, it is degenerative for the soil. And as we know, soil, an inch of soil may take up to 100 to 500 years to make, but we know that it can take a very short time, minutes, to lose the same inch. So, uh, Large-scale agriculture manages weeds using what we call a burn-down process, where a herbicide-like Roundup is used to kill the weeds. And I can understand that if you have 100, 500, 1,000 acres, will not be as easy to get all these weeds uh, being mechanical, uh, the way you'd work a small garden or a small farm. And that's why this advancement that we're calling no-till in large-scale agriculture should really be no-till slash chemical agriculture. That's what I'm in, uh, in indicating there. And one of you did actually send a question. I hope you're on the call right now. And say, would no-till increase the use of pesticides? And if I don't remember to say this again, no, on small scale, no-till actually eliminates pesticides. The gardens you saw in the opening slide there have not used pesticides. So again, we'll talk about that. And pesticides, it's not just herbicides. It's also pesticides against diseases and insect pests. 
that all becomes eliminated altogether in no chill. So there are a few concepts that we must understand before we continue talking about no till. They would not be, uh, no till would not be well understood if we did not talk about three concepts. One of them is soil health. The other one is regenerative agriculture. I just talked about degenerative. We'll talk about regenerative agriculture as well. And then cover crops. All of them are interrelated. They are not like in isolation. They all have common denominators. And no-till counts on each one of those concepts. But first, let's talk about soil health. And I have the definition over there. And I'd like for you to note a keyword or keywords, continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem. Not just this year or next year, throughout. So continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem. If I don't say it again, there's more life underground than above ground. And that's why we call soil, that is good, a living system. That's why we count on soil health because nothing that is not living can have health. You can pick up a piece of stone and talk about health in it. Soil is not dead. If it's dead, which it can be, then we want to call it dirt. That's what you bring into the house. Well, that's what, as we shall see, we'll have mismanaged. So soil is regenerative. It regenerates what's, what's been used down there. And we'll talk about that quite a bit. And to maintain soil health, try as much as always have roots in the ground. So all the time, Mother Nature never leaves ground bare. There's always something growing there. So even if a plant has died, let those roots stay, let those roots decay down there. They'll be supporting some microorganisms that are helpful to plant health. I have presented in the past a webinar where I argued that soil health produces healthy plants, which is true, has been observed. So, when you think soil health, think of the living ecosystem that is below the ground. It's a living entity. And like I said, if it weren't living, we would not ever refer to it as being healthy. That is the soil. Um, in dead soil, dead, I think, dead in quotes, you will not have all the animals you're seeing, all the organisms that you're observing in front of you there, all the way from micro to macro organisms. The bacteria and the fungi are eaten by nematodes and nematodes are eaten by arthropods and earthworms and the, the protozoa are also eaten by earthworms and as well as organic matter from plants which you got from the beginning there in trophic level one, and then and so forth and so forth. Bigger critters eat the smaller critters until the earthworms are eaten by the birds or some animals. You may have moles that are eating, or vole, well, moles that are eating earthworms. So um, all the good things that you see on this slide are in healthy soil. And when a soil is active, you don't even need sometimes to provide nitrogen because already it's fixing its own nitrogen. If you have an equilibrium with, uh, between all these living organisms in the soil, if I don't say it again, there are very few plant diseases in healthy soil because it's been shown that the pathogenic organisms, pathogens are disease causing organisms, pathogenic organisms get out competed or even eaten up by the good bacteria and fungi. So healthy soil will even support 
healthy plants without ever any pesticides being applied there. Permaculture gardens are akin to uh, or close to what no-till gardens are like. And healthy soil is the goal of no-till farming. So the second concept is about regenerative agriculture. And I know that everybody who is on the call has heard of sustainable agriculture where farming or gardening is self-supportive or self-sustaining. It's also environmentally friendly, no question about it. It's socially acceptable and profitable. Regenerative agriculture is much similar to sustainable agriculture, but it goes one step beyond in that it restores and regenerates or rebuilds soil organic matter and also restores degraded soil biodiversity, the ecosystem, whatever is living in there that we just saw a slide ago. It also mitigates the effects brought about by climate change. In this slide, I hope you can see the effects of industrial ag, sustainable ag, and regenerative agriculture on soil health over time. With industrial agriculture, you start off with soil health that is great. You just opened up a, a new farm. But however many years down in time, you want to open up a new field because this one has become very infertile, so to speak. And you have to really spoon feed it with NPK, synthetic fertilizers. In sustainable ag, you could just be breaking even, neither destroying the soil health nor building it. That's sustainable. But the regenerative aspect, you start off with soil health at whatever level it's at, but you start improving on it all the time. And that has great impact or is a great component in no-till agriculture. And that I'm referring to regenerative agriculture. In this slide, I compare, or the, I cut this from um, a not-for-profit, or it's called a farm, which is called Kiss the Ground, you can see over there. But in this slide, the emphasis is on a few key points that compare regenerative and degenerative, or in other words, conventional agriculture. And a few of those are, in, regener in regenerative agriculture, water is retained. You can, I mean, that makes sense. In degenerative agriculture, water is lost. You just stand over the soil, it was warm, it was damp down there, you just now expose the soil to the elements. What do we expect? A lot of evaporation. Land is cool in, in, in the regenerative agriculture. In degenerative agriculture, in the heat of July, this land has a fever. You can cook an egg. It's very hot. Biodiversity is high in regenerative ag, but it is very low in degenerative. The soil structure is well aggregated in the regenerative agriculture. And I'll be defining what, uh, aggregation in soil a few slides to come. In degenerative agriculture, yes, you have a soil structure, but now it's artificial. This is not natural at all, at all, at all. The carbon footprint in regenerative agriculture is very low, whereas it's very high. You're sending off carbon into the atmosphere, which you should be retaining in the soil. Part of the food source for plants is carbon in the soil. You want to retain it in there. That's why on the left, regenerative agriculture, it's a carbon sink. The plants are using carbon dioxide to photosynthesize, but once they decay, that carbon is trapped in the soil. The cost of inputs on in regenerative agriculture could be high in the beginning, first few years maybe. But in later years, once you hit an equilibrium, it should be okay. In degenerative agriculture, the costs are always high. 
And I just like to ask this question, if you are an earthworm, which side of, or which land would you prefer to, to, to live in? All right. And then. Uh, so sorry. let's talk about what a cover crop is. So cover crops are plants that are planted to cover the soil rather than for the purpose of being harvested. So it's not gonna be a cash crop. You're not gonna get profit off of it. But cover crops are also known as living mulches or green manures. They're grown between the cash crop cycles. So if you take out a cash crop, such as your broccoli, and you're putting a quick growing cover crop, um, or if you incorporate it with the cash crop to cover the ground, like in your vegetable fields, your orchards, or your agricultural sites, where it's gonna be planted in between the rows like the picture shows there. They can be an alternative to mulching with leaves or conventional mulches such as plastic or straw. Uh, they will protect the soil over the winter months. So um, the biggest problem that you have uh, during high irrigation or winter months is that you have removal of the soil if you have high winds, you have removal of the soil. So basically the cover crop is gonna be a crop grown for the protection and enrichment of the soil and the microbes within the soil that James just mentioned. Next. So let's talk a little bit about advantages of cover cropping. So basically cover crops will build soil health uh, they will help increase the soil organic matter and the legumes will provide nitrogen credits for future crops. They help to maintain populations of mycorrhizal fungi spores that are in the, spoil, in the soil, uh, which in turn will assist with the root system growth of your plants. It will ha have improved nutrient efficiency and increased water absorption and utilization. The pollen and nectar that's produced by cover crops, such as buckwheat, uh, can be important food sources for the predatory insects, which can control the insects that damage your crops, thereby breaking pest life cycles. By using cover crops, either before planting the cash crop or planting with the cash crop, you'll increase the soil organic matter. When it comes to nutrient retention, Cover crops will help to supply the nutrients to the crop as they break down in the soil. And these cover crops can be incorporated into the soil to increase the organic matter content as well. Cover crops will help to prevent soil erosion when the soil sits fallow or unplanted. The root systems of these crops can go deep and will hold the soil in place during those high winds irrigation and or minor flooding events. These plants will also add residues that are readily consumed or used by soil organisms. If you're planting your row cover crop along with your cash crop, like in walkways or alternative rows that you saw in the other picture, you're creating a physical barrier of residue on the soil surface that can inhibit weeds and weed seed germination. There are also some cover crops such as mustard greens that will release chemicals into the soil to help reduce populations of nematodes and pathogenic fungi. Next. So this slide gives you a website that you can go to that will give you more information as far as cover crops. It's called the Midwest Cover Crops Council. And they within this website, they have a decision tool so when thinking of cover crops, you want to find a crop that will winter kill or die back when the temperatures drop to about 15 degrees or so Fahrenheit. This website will help you to determine which cover crops are best for your area. It will help you to choose the best crop based on what you're trying to accomplish, whether it's soil erosion or adding nitrogen or suppressing weeds. It will also help you to determine the best time of year to plant the crop. Again, it's gonna depend on where you live. 
So again, you want the crops that are gonna winter kill so you don't have to worry about using chemicals to, to die, kill them back in the springtime before you plant. But once they're killed, the biomass will become a protective layer of organic material, which will suppress the weed growth in the spring and add uh, organic matter and nutrients to the soil as the roots de decay. In the spring, you can just plant directly into this protective layer. The biggest problem that most the smaller growers would have is when they have this layer of this protective layer of the dead plant material that they just lay the seeds within that residue. Um, but if the seed doesn't come into direct contact with the soil, they won't germinate. So there will be a, a time when, if you have a thick layer of that residue that you need to make a shallow or a thin cutting within the material of where you want the seed to go and make sure the seed has that soil uh, contact. We recommend the cover crops on the slide for small gardens uh, because number one, some of them are cheap. Uh, number two, oats, soybean, and tillage radish are generally winter killed. Uh, clover replenishes the soil nitrogen because it is a, considered a legume product. And tillage radishes reconditions clay soil structure. So if you have clay soil, planting a cover crop of these radishes will help to break up that clay soil as it degrades into the soil itself, you're adding the organic matter, again, breaking up that, that clay soil over time. Next. James? Is that me? Okay. So again, um, just an illustration of the benefit of uh, cover crops, um, bare soil, it's uh, less likely for loss of carbon into the air and water. So again, you don't want that. You want to, you in between seasons or in between rows, you want to cover that. And I said that earlier, the way mother nature would do, uh, just do it. This is what we have to do to retain our soils uh, retain the structure, retain the productivity, um, and that's where the cover crops come in. They're just the opposite here. That's what this just to illustrate that. And there was this experiment done um, by some researchers who compared combining no-till and cover crops compared to conventional till practices. And they were they checked on the aggregate stability of soil, which you see in the first. I don't know if you can see the pointer here. The first um, diagram here, the one talking about aggregate stability, and I will define what aggregate stability is. It is the ability of a soil to regulate the movement and storage of air and water throughout the soil profile. And how does it do that? It, this is determined by the soil makeup as a mix of sand, silt, and clay particles. I don't know if you know, but sand has very large pore spaces. The porosity is large. Whereas pure clay is equal to Play-Doh. You don't have any pore space. You have to mix uh, the, the, these three components to get enough porosity in the soil. And with that porosity, then soil particles are held by some glues that are provided by microorganisms. And then in between the soil particles, you do have the spaces that allow air and water to pass through. And the, the best uh, observation by these researchers was that aggregate stability was retained, very well retained, where no-till and a cover crop were combined. That's what is shown in the aggregate stability. 
There, the observations there were all over the place, too variable to allow any conclusions. Although you still see no-till and cover crop in every aspect, the total microbial mass or total microbial abundance, all the nodulations to have been slightly better anyway with no-till and cover crops, but statistically that wasn't very obvious. So at least the aggregate stability was shown to be very sensitive to tilling. So that destroyed that capability for water and air to move within the soil. And so we come to what is no-till. And the simplest definition of no-till farming or gardening is growing crops or pasture. Now, pasture is grass. And most people don't think of grass as a crop. It is a crop and should be treated like any crop that we grow. But anyway, for, for, for now, no-till farming uh, is growing crops or pasture from year to year without disturbing the soil. Always back to not disturbing the soil. So in large scale operations, crop seed is dr drilled directly into the plant residues of a previous crop. That's what the soybean and corn farmers do. And it is loss, you know, the loss of carbon from soil to air, it retains soil structure for the most part and saves gas. So the carbon footprint is less for sure. And there are other benefits too. The system used is commodity crop plantings that rely on large equipment and monoculture to be efficient. You know how they grow these crops. However, the dynamics change when the size of the operation is changed to five or fewer acres and the crop diversity of a, of a market gardening brings increased levels of specialized growth habit and care. When you have five acres, you're not just growing one crop. Well, recently people who are growing marijuana or the hemp are growing the only one crop, but in small acreage, we tend to have diversity because that's how economical it can be when, when we have diversity. So no-till marketing on a small scale has less use of mechanized equipment. The picture you see at the bottom there, I don't even know what equipment, mechanized equipment you would be taking in there. Sure, this is a very small garden, but pretty soon I'll be giving you um, a video or urging you to watch a video that has lots of information where a little bit of mechanization is used because if you're going to use to do composting, then you'll need a tractor small tractor, maybe with a bucket, to move your plants around to where you're doing composting, those types of operations. But mostly you're not using mechanization on small, on small no-till systems. In any case, you're not weeding, so that eliminates the need for equipment anyhow. And maybe at this point in time, those of you who are doubtful or wondering whether we should turn to, should turn to no till, um, we, since 1900 to the year 2000, it's been estimated that we've lost about two thirds of carbon from the soil, or we've lost quite a lot of topsoil for that matter. And they say if we continue unchanged, if we don't start conserving soil, with practices like no-till, then we only have another 100 years of soil to farm at a time when the population of the world is almost doubling or going to be one and a half times uh, more very soon. And again, no-till advantages, the best, one of the best advantages, little weeding, you always get a stubborn plant, okay? You always get a plant here and there, but there's very little weeding. And in every, class that, in every class that I have been to, where specialty, specialty crop growers were, and even field crop growers, and we asked them what's their number one challenge in crop production, almost invariably, 99.9% .9 of the time, 
they say it's weeds. So if you are doing very little weeding, you are saving a lot of money and time. But there is also less watering, better soil, and therefore better ha harvests. And you have great soil aggregation as shown in another in a picture elsewhere. Okay. So if no till has all these advantages, why isn't everybody getting into it? Why isn't everybody jumping into it? People don't like change. Let's first of all just begin like that. And mindset change can be slow. People want to see if it is working for somebody else before they try it themselves. Others may just be doubtful, it won't work, okay? And, and, and one of you actually even asked a question about, would any crop grow in no-till? And I never thought about it. But the answer is yes, after, after doing some research, I found that any crop can be grown in a no-till system anywhere. But there's a little caveat. In no-till agriculture, one may have to wait a little longer to plant because when you turn over the soil, it warms up faster. In untanned soil, where there's no-till, it will take longer to warm up and you don't want to put your seeds in the cold and get failure to germinate. But on the other hand, maybe when you're looking for seed, you could actually ask for varieties or appropriate varieties that will tolerate lower temperatures. So that would be the caveat on, on, on the no-till there. And there was another question too that I can address here. Will no-till increase herbicide reliance? Yes and no. On very large scale agriculture, you may want to do the burn down that I explained in the beginning. On small scale, indeed pesticides, whether herbicides, insecticides or fungicides, those you may have to cut out altogether. Okay. So uh, there are a few things. Tilling problems, what are some tilling problems? And you may be familiar with this. Uh, you may already know this. The soil underneath, what we can't see, is a weed seed bank. When we till, we are plowing the weeds we see under. But simultaneously, we are just bringing the seeds up for new weeds to grow. And this is one of the avoidances or the things we avoid in no till. Why bring more seeds up here to germinate when you could just leave them there, let them sit there, and some of these seeds, and I, I mean like the mustard seeds, they say they dug up a monastery somewhere, and they, dug, they, can, they kind of stumbled onto some mustard seeds that they dated to be 600 years old. 11 of them germinated. And there are lots of other weed seeds that are down there that are just waiting to see light and some warmth, and they just sp sp sprout. Some take two years, longevity is two years, some 10 years, some 20, 40 years, and all that. So no wonder that weeding is our number one problem because you put, you put the ones you're seeing under and you just bring up more seed for more. Uh, weeds. Okay, all right. In this experiment, two plots were grown with corn and then over four years, as you can see there, and they were assessed for soil loss. In, in the two experiments, there was a set of plots that were mold bolded, mold board plowed, and others that were not tilled at all. And I just want you to look at the extreme right two columns, which is talking about erosion. Uh, that is loss of soil in pounds per acre per year. And 
you can tell that, or you can, if you do a quick math, within the four years, there was 800 times more soil loss in plowed land compared to the no-till uh, plots. I mean, that speaks volumes right there. We are losing soil on a big scale when we do the tilling. And this was shown very well. And they, of course, considered the slope of the land, the management activities. They, they tried their best to keep these two plots similar in management. But that's a very big uh, um, dramatic difference here. We should uh, change anybody's mind if you are willing to go the naughty route. And I've been talking about soil aggregation. I should have had this little diagram bottom right hand corner earlier on so that I can explain aggregation better. But each blue circle there, and I don't know if you can see there are dots in it. Each dot is a soil particle. So many of them, hundreds of them, bound together, like I said, by a glue that is sticky and is produced by microorganisms. And so a soil, the, the big, the big, so the round circle, blue circle is an aggregate of soil particles. And the way they are held is such that in between them, and this is highly diagrammatic, but still, the way they are held, the, soil, the, the, the aggregate clumps of soil, is such that you have water in between them and air. And so this is porous, highly porous soil, and it irregulates how these two components, air and water, move. And such a system is perfect for microbial and macroorganism growth. And it's also great for plants. And it's the system that tilling destroys. This is what we want to retain in no-till. So because we are losing so much in nutrients, we have to spoon feed the kind of soil you see on the top picture there that is being tilled every year with nutrients, just because we lost everything. Okay, so we have a background information here. So let's start on developing our no-till garden. So there's uh, two ways that you can do it. Number one, you already have a garden or conventional garden and you wanna transfer it over to a no-till garden or you wanna start something from scratch. So the first thing, make sure that your garden, especially if you're growing vegetables or fruits, that it's gonna be in a full sun, south facing area so you can get uh, the sunlight that's gonna be required for most vegetables, they require uh, six or more hours of sunlight, if at all possible. Uh, the next thing you'll need to do after you decide where you're going to put the garden is to do a soil test. So the soil test, whether it is an existing garden or a new one, the soil test is going to give you information as to uh, any nutrients that are in the soil, what's the type of organic matter, what's the pH of the soil, and all these things are going to be important. So getting a soil test, you're going to, there are several uh, websites that you can go to to teach you how to do a soil test, but you're going to take random samples throughout the area. You'll throw them into a box, you'll mix it all up, and then you get a, uh, a sample of that mixture and then you take it in for soil testing. Uh, once you get the results back, uh, well, when you take it in, they will ask you, is this going to be a garden? Is this a lawn? What, what are you testing for? And so if you say that it's going to be for a garden or garden area, they can give you uh, more specific um, recommendations on your soil test based on the results. So they can tell you uh, if you need to add nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium and how much you need to add per acre. And then you just kind of... Uh, calculate it based on how many, uh, how much land you have for your garden area. So the soil test is going to be really important to do. Soil tests should be done every three years, if at all possible. 
And then the next thing you wanna do after you get the space and you get your soil test back and you add any type of uh, nutrients or, or sources that you need to add in order to get the pH correct, depending on the plants that you're growing um, and all that, then you wanna start gathering your materials together. And so when you're starting a no-till garden, you wanna use organic materials. You wanna use things like newspapers and cardboard, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Compost. Now, James mentioned a little bit earlier about doing composting. So if you're composting on your own property or you, you have a composter that you're using and you transfer it over to your garden area, you know, make sure you have enough to be able to incorporate into the soil itself, as well as any type of organic material. Uh, next. Okay, so it is easy to create these things. So let's start with gardens that haven't been developed yet. So you're starting with an area that may have some grass or a grassy mound or an area that has grass in it. So the first thing you probably want to do is to mow that grass as close as possible. Um, that will help to reduce the amount of uh, problems that you're going to have when you start developing your garden bed. Some people uh, initially can do tilling in this spot uh, to be able to break up that soil, uh, to uh, maybe incorporate some of that grass material into the soil itself. What will, it will break down and start developing or uh, giving the soil some organic matter. So after you're mowing on that, you can um, till it if you want, or some people also use a, a product to kill the grass or to kill the weeds or anything that will be in that garden area. Now remember that uh, when you till that area, those weed seeds that are in the soil are going to be turned over and they will start to germinate. And so what you may want to do is to take all that material and um, Take the material, the, the seeds, let them germinate, and then do a second killing on that if you want. Till it a second time, um, and it will help to uh, eliminate some of those weed seed banks. Or you can just let them go and then start developing your no-till garden. Uh, for those that are using raised beds, so if you're not planting directly in ground, you can use raised beds for no-till, and it's a very easy, simple way to do that. Uh, our community garden that we started in my area uh, was on grass, and unfortunately the grass we had was Bermuda grass, and if you've ever had to deal with Bermuda grass, it tends to grow underground through rhizomes, and so even if I kill the grass on top or put something on top, I still had some grass that was coming in from the sides underground. So, you know, be aware of what type of grass or what type of uh, environment that you're putting your uh, raised beds in. So when we decided to do the raised beds, we had the area all staked out. We knew where the beds were going. We got some large cardboard boxes that most of the businesses within town were throwing away, so it was free cardboard for us. Uh, we go ahead and cut it in there. We put it on the ground itself where the raised bed was gonna go. And then we put the raised bed itself on top of the cardboard. Okay, so you're gonna measure your raised rows. You're gonna decide how wide you want them, how long you want them, and how many inches between rows that you wanna have them. Uh, if you are doing a no-till garden, uh, having walkways is beneficial, so you don't have to do any type of mowing between those, those rows if you have concerns. Um, but planting those cover crops is going to be very beneficial. So again, place cardboard on the ground, put the raised bed on top of that. Now, when you're starting a, a row itself, uh, either in the ground or in the raised bed itself, you want to use things like organic materials, things like straw, that can be broken down, uh, chopped leaves, you can uh, use those, any type of composting material that you may have, any type of topsoil that you have or purchase from the store, that can also be included in with this. And so you're going to lay uh, on the rows themselves in ground, you're going to lay the combination of all these things about two to four inches high. It's going to be the basis of where it's going to sit on top of the cardboard 
You're going to add the top soil again, two inches high if at all possible. And then you're going to go ahead and develop the row so that it's higher in the middle than it is down toward the sides because as this ground starts to settle, that middle will settle down eventually. And so that's going to be important as well. Otherwise, if you have it layered uh, as equal as it rains, then it's still going to start to depress into the ground itself. Uh, so make sure that you have that and that overall on that you want to be able to water it in. So getting those rows developed, maybe having them a little bit raised than the ground itself. Uh, if you don't have the topsoil, if you don't have any compost that you can use, you can start developing your rows between the beds by shoveling the dirt out between the rows and putting it where you want to put the beds. So that's another option. And then those valleys or those little divots that you have where the soil was removed, you can start using that as walkways and put maybe some sort of wood chips or mulch or something in there where you're going to be walking. Next. All right, so you, we talked about the site and we talked about setting up the garden. Uh, so you want to be able to, as you see here, he's doing an in-ground, but those behind him are the raised beds. So the in-ground, he has all the material uh, that's going to be in there. Now remember that even in ground, you're still going to have weed seeds that are going to blow into there. So even with a no-till situation, you still will see some seeds. So keep in mind that when you, if you do see seed germination or weed germination within your gardens throughout the years, remove them as they're small. So we killed the grass underneath and we uh, wetted it down. So we started softening the soil underneath there. Um, and then what we did is that we came by and we uh, added the compost and wood chips or anything else that needed to be there. Um, so this is basically what it's going to be looking like. Again, in the raised beds in the back, you don't have to worry about uh, the weed seeds as much. Um, and as you can see, he does have the mulch around those raised beds that's going to help um, uh, reduce the, the amount of weeds that get into the beds or into the garden itself. Next. All right, and then what you're going to do is add layers of organic matter, like I mentioned. So you may have two or four inches of soil, but what you want to be able to do now is to add more organic matter. As you can see, he's using straw. In our community gardens, we used a lot of um, compost. Uh, that we made through the garden itself. The compost was added in the springtime. It was incorporated into the raised bed itself and we incorporate it not by tilling but by incorporating it using uh, hand tools. So if you have uh, anything like uh, lime, if you if you know that your pH needs to be raised or lowered, you know adding the lime or the sulfur is going to be important. Um, so in your raised beds or in your ground beds for your um, no-till garden, those elements such as lime and sulfur should be fine, uh, a fine powder if at all possible. The fine powder of the lime and the sulfur tends to break down quickly and it tends to have a quicker response on the uh, capacity of the soil in order to raise or lower the pH. If it's a really fine type of a powder that you're using, then just watering it in is going to be sufficient and you don't have to do any tilling in order to get it into the soil. So um, after you add that, you can add um, wood chips. But if you add wood chips to your soil, then what you need to do is to make sure that you add a little bit more nitrogen to the soil. The wood chips will break down, the microorganisms will break down the wood chips, but they're using nitrogen as a source of energy. And so if they're using that nitrogen to help break down those wood chips or wood products, then there won't be enough nitrogen for the plants. So adding a little bit extra nitrogen is going to be beneficial. 
some of the nitrogen sources that you can use are things like mill organic, which again, I believe is a, a, a product that can be uh, incorporated into the soil if you want. Um, also, cottonseed meal is another type of um, nitrogen source, but this tends to be slightly acidic. So it may be beneficial to use, um, if you have uh, plants that require a lower pH, cottonseed meal would be good. But uh, the cottonseed meal is generally a slow release form. And so it's not going to do a quick down and dirty change in the soil. It's gonna be slow release and available to plants over time. Next. So now we have our garden set. We know where the beds are going to go. We know where our walkways are going to do. Now you need to start planting and maintaining this garden. So you're going to sow the seeds or the plant seedlings as for any other garden. This is nothing different than what you would do in a conventional planting. So you're going to have the beds either delineated or, or outlined or raised beds. Again, you're going to make a furrow in the soil. You'll drop the seed. Uh, or if you have something like a, a a bulb or something that's going to be a transplant, then you want to be able to lift it out of the hole, the dirt out of the hole, and then plant it, and then and then we incorporate the dirt into there. Um, once this is done, just like a regular garden, you're going to water it as needed. Between the rows, between seasons, you're going to plant the cover crops. So if you have a cash crop like broccoli that you're planting in your rows, and you harvest that broccoli crop, but you are going to plant maybe pumpkins a little bit later. Well, broccoli is a cool season crop. Pumpkins you'll plant maybe July, somewhere around there, early, mid-July. So between the time of the harvest of the broccoli and the planting of the pumpkins, you want to be able to have something in that soil so that it's not sitting fallow or unplanted. So this is where you're going to look in that Midwest cover crop website and say, okay, I have a four to six or eight week or 12 week period here where, where I I'm not gonna put anything in this garden, but I, I wanna grow something that's gonna be beneficial. That's where that website's gonna help you. So you can go in there, you may see that something like buckwheat, uh, which is quick growing, uh, can be incorporated into your garden. So you may have a summer crop sitting next to the cover crop that you're gonna plant, which is the buckwheat. And as this buckwheat grows, it's gonna bring in those beneficial insects for germination. It's gonna bring in all these. So the cover crops that you're gonna use is gonna be based on when you need it. In the fall, when we start looking at um, these crops or these garden beds, uh, you're gonna start trying to figure out, okay, now wh what do I need to do? Do I need, did I use a lot of nitrogen or did I plant a lot of crops that required high nitrogen sources in order to grow? So you may think that you may need to add a little bit more nitrogen. But basically, you're going to, for maintaining, you're going to sow the seeds, water, and then keep it just like a regular garden itself. Next. Right, so on the maintenance, again, minor weeding, watering is needed. Remember, you don't have to do a whole lot of weeding if you're doing this correctly, other than seeds that might germinate or blow in from, from other areas outside of the garden area. Uh, they may start to grow on top of the soil, but if you get rid of them while they're small, you shouldn't have a problem with that. So you will have some minor weeding, just kind of keep an eye on that. You can also do a mulch, such as the straw that you see in the picture there, between underneath the plants or around the plants in order to help reduce those the germination of those weed seeds that blow in. And then of course, you're gonna water as needed. Now, uh, the harvesting and all that, you're gonna, in the fall, what you wanna be able to do is to harvest those, the fruits of your plants, but you don't really need to remove the whole plant. Remember what we said that cover crops, you're looking to keep the root system in the soil because those roots will break down as the roots decay they create uh, holes within the aggregates of the soil, which gives the air pockets uh, that's needed to have a healthy soil. And those roots will break down and add the organic matter. So in the fall, you may wanna just cut back the top of that plant, maybe to about 
two inches or so high above the soil line, but leave the stumps there, leave those roots there, okay? And then what you wanna be able to do is spread a thick layer of mulch over the soil. And again, this is not just for the crops that you're growing in ground, you can do this same technique in raised beds. So you're gonna, uh, after that, you'll spread a thick layer of mulch of the soil or manures, uh, cover crops in our raised beds, in our gardens, we plant cover crops. So we go to the store, we find a package of cover crop seed mixture uh, that is already put together for us. If you are looking to custom make your own, that uh, Midwest Cover Crop website will help you to determine what type of crops you will need and you can make your own mix. So you're gonna put those cover crops down, you're gonna leave them intact, and then in the next spring, uh, those hopefully you'll use ones that'll kill over the winter, and then you're gonna uh, let those cover crops sit there, sit on top of the soil, let it cover the soil to reduce any type of seed germinations, and then what you're going to do is add in the springtime is to add more compost, add more mulch, and then start all over again. Just make a slit, put your seeds in there, uh, water it, and keep it, uh, keep it going throughout the summer time. Next. All right, and we talked about reducing compaction. So every time you till your garden, the soil structure, what James just talked about, about the soil peds and all that, those soil structures will break down and will increase the potential for soil compaction in your garden. By using a no-till system, you're not running a tiller over the ground. You're not tilling it up. You're not changing or destroying that soil structure. So you're reducing compaction through a no-till process. But you also need to uh, have these walkways that you can set up. So when you set up your garden, make sure that the width of your beds, you can access the center of that bed from the walkways on either side. I've seen several large, uh, several small growers that are just getting into this and they have 10 foot bed widths. But when they find out in the middle of summer when they're trying to harvest the tomatoes, they can't really get into that center without stepping into the bed itself. So use walkways, use some sort of mulching material. If you have problems with weeds in the walkways, you may want to just go ahead and put some landscape fabric down on the bottom of the walkway itself and then add your mulch or wood chips or whatever it is that you're going to use. So set your walkways. That's very important in creating uh, those no-till gardens. Okay. Next. Okay, so this is just a picture here. Answering one of the questions is, one person asked, is no-till really feasible? Is it doable? Yeah, and this picture shows that. One answer, the one thing that I would like for you to note is that it is not something you start this year and next year it looks like this. It may take two, three years before you start seeing this kind of a picture here. But it is doable. And all the things that Rory have, has explained are visible here. This is a pepper garden and it is just looking great. Mulching, uh, because of time as well, I won't spend so much time. Um, we know the advantages of mulching, you know, conserving water itself, it breaks down to become uh, food, future food for the plants that you're going to grow. And that as long as organic matter is getting into clay, there was this a question right now in the chat box about how do I loosen up clay? Keep bringing all your leaves that you collect from your maple trees into that garden and incorporate them, but that will take you several years. That will be quite a little while. And the other answer, of course, is if you're going to, if you're not going to start building up, and I hope you've started seeing that this no-till gardening can also be, you can also be going above ground, not always below ground. 
So if you want to go below ground and work your clay soil, start planting um, tillage, radish. It's able to grow into the clay soil. It's very uh, aggressive in its growth and it will loosen and create those pathways that we want below there to loosen that soil and add organic matter down there. And mulch is not just plant material, organic material, you can also use plastic. And we've actually been shown that red plastic is beneficial for tomatoes because of reflection of the infrared rays. So mulching definitely is a big deal, especially if you are keeping weeds down, it's a big deal in no-till, no question about it. In this picture here, I don't know what was done here, but I'm suspecting that um, the end of the year, somebody has already harvested what was in the bed in the foreground and then thrown in something like oats that are growing in there and maybe they've been harvested. I don't know, he's harvested that. But that's what it would look like towards the end of, or the beginning of winter, where you threw in, when I say throw in, you broadcast seed into an existing crop, say for instance, oats. And we say oats because that's very cheap seed. You broadcast it in there, loosely cover it with topsoil or even grass or some kind of other organic mulch and let it grow. If you don't cover it, the mice and the birds and the squirrels will be having a few day there. So you want to cover that and then it will grow and die off in the winter. And then at this point, just paying uh, tribute to some of the smaller, smaller, smaller uh, gardens that we could make. And you've heard of lasagna notio garden, which is layered and you need to read from the bottom upwards. You have your cardboard that stops any weeds from growing. And in itself, it's organic matter to decompose. Add wood chips or straw, add organic materials, which could be um, compost, manure, uh, not manure, but compost. And then you plant whatever or water lightly and then, and then well, before you plant, you water lightly and then yeah, plant your low maintenance cover crops after after the season, that would be after the season, of course. So, and that arrangement is there. One of our educators here who just left was doing research on growing uh, crops in containers like this. You know, the grow, the grow bag, where you can layer uh, these components and grow something. Then, I don't know if any of you have tried the straw bales. Again, it's no till, no tilling anything. Past time we did it here in Kankaki, there was a great turnout of people volunteering to come and grow something in the straw bales that we provided. And yes, here you might be limited to what you can grow. Ensure that you have a little bit of soil on top of the straw bale so that you can put your seed into that soil. And then it will find, the roots will go inside the straw bale. You can secure the straw bale to stabilize it tight with wire. It will of course decompose with time. And I think you can use it for two years if you, if you tie it nicely so that it doesn't fall into bits. The shorter plants are stabler on, on uh, straw bale, so you trying to plant corn might not be the best thing when it's blowing the wind, the whole thing might come over. But the shorter plants will do just fine. Container gardens, again, no till, a very little tilling. You always find a weed that got in there somehow. You cannot uh, be weed free 100%. But there are quite a lot of advantages. They save on space, they are clean and they won't mess your balcony if they are there. You can prevent cross-pollination. Uh, 
the cucumbers, they are very promiscuous. You might have a pumpkin and a cucumber cross, cross pollinating. So you wanna keep those separate, that helps because you got these pots. If you have rosemary growing out there and it gets to winter in our climates here, you can bring the plant indoors so it's movable. Uh, the challenge could be watering because when you have container gardens, drainage is very good. Water gets out, gets to the bottom so very fast. So you may need to water more compared to the to, to in ground. Same thing with the uh, strawberries. I found that you need to water quite a bit, quite a bit more often than in the ground. You can buy a soil bag, open it up. Don't get, you know, just lay it on the ground. Actually, I like to make slits, a, a neck, a slit that is a neck, so that you don't remove the flaps. The flaps themselves should serve as a mulch of some sort. Then plant in rows in, along that X, and that should serve you pretty good. I put another picture here of a strawberry garden, garden which compared eggplants that were grown on a strawberry versus those that were grown in a pot. The two, the, the different eggplants there are the same age. And you can see the difference, it speaks for itself. Okay. Oh, is this mine? Okay, so there are reasons why people fail in no-till. And one is you started off with seed varieties that are not code tolerant and you wondered why they didn't just come up. You didn't get the right varieties. And secondly, you didn't rotate crops. Rotate crops between those that can fix nitrogen and those that can't so that you replenish any nutrients while that were used. And then again, God forbid, if you had some seedlings you bought and they brought in diseases with them, don't have the same type of crop or same related crop in there. Check what you have a deficiency of so that you can emphasize on that. And there are many organic nutrient sources out there, fish meal and the others that uh, Laurie mentioned. That is if you are organic. If you are not organic, then you can go the conventional way. Now leave enough residue to smoother any weeds that may be wanting to come. And that residue also is your future food for plants because it will decompose. And then there is lack of know-how, how to do it. And then failure to commit. Don't, do not give up the first year. If you start this year, don't give up in 2021. I would tell you to keep going and 2023 or 2024, you may see excellent results. So think about the crop. Oh, think about the land and not the crop. If you're thinking about soil loss, soil aggregation, biodiversity in soil, soil health, if you're thinking about those things, don't worry that you didn't get good yields the first year or that you had too many weeds the first year. Be committed to the land and it will pay dividends in the long run. And again, I wanted to pay a small bit of, uh, not small, I wanted to pay some tribute to small gardens and read for yourself. Smallholder farmers are probably the ones who will feed the world in the long run. Look at the diversity of crops, 2.1 million different varieties, as opposed to 80,000 in large scale farming and so forth and so forth. How many calories are we obtaining for every one calorie ex expended? 15 calories we obtain for every one calorie we expend in small farms. On the other hand, for every calorie spent in large farms, you only get a tenth of that. So read this for yourself. I am just saying there's a place for smallholder farming in the future, no question about it. And smallholder farmers are the ones feeding the world anyway. Look at 70% versus 30%. And then there's always the question of how profitable is this? And I want all of you, you're still on, well, there were 31, now 29, 
all of you please go to this video that is given in this uh, slide here. Uh, this couple in California, they are netting $100,000 per acre per year. Okay. Now, how are they doing that? They have, they explained that very well. They've been persistent. They have set and they have come to an equilibrium six, seven years later. They now know exactly what to do. They don't spare labor if labor is needed. Of that 100,000, maybe 56 days inputs. But they're happy with that. They have four to six acres, I remember. Is it five acres? So with $200,000, they're comfortable. They should be comfortable. And they compared themselves to others. And others are not doing as well as they are doing. And they, they can't emphasize enough how good no tilling is. I, I really urge you to watch this video. To get you to the no to your mindset, can read for yourself. The first thing, the first bullet there talks about three things, patience, patience, patience. Just don't be in a rush, okay? Keep records. What did you not do well last year? What that, did you do well last year that you can repeat? Keep those records, okay? And then I'm sure you're going to go home asking yourself, do I till, do I do reduced till, do I, and I dig this, all this thing. But you know what? Experimenting is the best way to answer that question. Do you save by not plowing? Are you saving in terms of labor? Yes, you must be. You must be saving in terms of gas if you are over if you're about five acres. Um, are you increasing the number of earthworms by cubic foot? Dig a foot and see if you have increased the number of earthworms. That's always an indicator of how good your soil and organic matter is. Try different varieties. Are they performing different on different farming systems? No teal versus steel. Just try it. Would you rather go with clover to fix your nitrogen or do you want to buy synthetic fertilizer? Get your hands dirty on a piece of land. And the future of no-till is bright. You've all heard the stories that are going on with weeds developing or having developed resistance to herbicides. Roundup is not as rosy as it used to be a few years back because plants have already come up with new genetics, so uh, the herbicides are losing. And then you have to, to, to listen to the consumer. They are asking for, even if not organic, naturally grown plants. Without, and they are, the, the main worries about is, is pesticides, non-GMO, non-pesticide non kind of production. And so even sustainable agriculture is leaning towards no-till. We were quite unsure whether to give this presentation when we don't have university-based research until we found this one reference by USDA, which they are calling Quiet Revolution. It's in the reference section. And so they are also talking about a revolution that is happening slowly but surely. And lots of people out there uh, painting rosy pictures about no-till. And if more and more people do it, newer technologies will appear or may appear as universities, like I just told you, somebody on, who just uh, moved on to another university was doing research on no-till. So that more and more information will come. And I've put their sustainable and better yet, regenerative. That's the catch word right now. That's the hot word right now, regenerative agriculture, where both plants and crops go side by side. There's a question already about using chicken tractors, and that's a great idea, and we'll talk about it in a minute. So you got all these references, and it is reference number three there, no to vegetable production, the YouTube video that Please, if you don't read anything else or watch anything else, look at this particular one. It gives you lots of good information.
and answers to your questions. More uh, references, if you want to read some more. That's one I found, Oregon State University there. And there are not very many uh, universities that are doing, have any, any reports. I like Mother Earth News, the second one over there, because they are pretty much based on scientific reporting. So I like that. Jim and Mary Comperi, you need to hear about them. You can actually get their videos. And this is the only book I could find. And if you want to read some more, I recommend that one. And then you asked us, should we go with the questions in the chat box first? What do you think, Tori? Well, we can. And then I think some of the questions that are in the chat box are also probably some of the questions that you got. So okay. Will this recording, well, maybe you can answer this one. Will this recording be on the website? Uh, the recording will be on our Illinois um, Local Food Small Farms YouTube site. Illinois plus, Local Food Small yeah, Farms. And, yes. And plus, if anybody asks requests for it, write to us. Write to either me or all you get. We'll get it to you. Yes. And we, I will send you a link after uh, it's completed and up on the site. I'll send a link to everybody that registered. Right. So, so how do you go go ahead. Ahead. Oh, how do you plant a cover crop without tilling? First of all, even with those who till, clover, you know how they do that on uh, uh, in January or February? They just broadcast it on top of snow. Once the snow melts, gets on the ground, through uh, freezing, thawing and freezing, the seeds are covered in there and they just grow. That is like dead giveaway. And clover is a legume, it fixes nitrogen. You can plant things around it. So again, it's just good to have. So that, that's an easy one. So let me, With there's oats, a question just above that. It says, can, um, would you, how would you incorporate soil amendments with no-till? So this guy uh, has soil that's heavy loam and he wants to lighten the soil. So again, you know, what James said is that you can uh, take your soil amendments and put it into the soil itself. You can mix it with a hand trowel if you want. What you're trying not to do is to get two, four, six inches down where those weed seeds are going to start coming to the surface. So you can do, you can rake it in if you have organic matter, or you can just leave it on the top and eventually, as that organic matter breaks down, it will go down into the soil. Don't forget you have the earthworms and all those soil microbes that are working down there with you. So, so you know, you have two ways of doing it, but you don't need to do a full till to be able to get them into the soil. Sure. And I think I also explained earlier on that if you have your oats and you want to put them on your beds without tilling, then you can come up with your compost and cover that. So you avoid the tilling aspect. And I and like I said earlier on, some of these no-till gardens is just a question of building the map upwards always. You never go downwards. So yeah, you can avoid tilling that way. What are your thoughts on chicken tractors? Um, I've been doing programs here about raising chickens and doing chickens on pasture. Um, wherever those tractors are placed, the chickens drop manure and that is very well fertilized. So at the end of your harvest season, if you want to pull your tractor in there so that, well, there's nothing to eat there. There are no weeds, there's no grass there. Unless you have a cover crop, you could pull, but then again, you're going to mess up your garden if you pull your tractor there. These chicken tractors are usually on pasture, okay? So, um, next question is does, does straw have weed seeds in it? And I think we've had a couple of questions concerning straw and hay. Oh, that, that we were also going to come to. So, whenever you get your hay, and yes, you have to be aware of what you're using as a, as a, as a mulch. Because, again, you're trying to avoid the weeds, you don't want to bring in the weeds. So, the point at which the, the mulch was harvested is critical. You don't want to bring in those seeds. So hay 
tends to have more wheat seeds than straw. Um, so yes. they, sometimes some people said that they use the first cut of hay instead of straw and that can be good as long as there aren't any wheat seeds within that hay. The biggest problem that you have is that people may have harvested the hay and then you know let it sit over winter and then try and apply it in the garden in the springtime thinking that everything has died and that's not the case. So if I had a choice between hay and straw, I would probably use straw over hay just because of the potential for weed seeds in the hay itself. All right. So the, the next question is overall, does no-till take up more land area? Uh, okay. Does that get mitigated by the benefits? First of all, yes. <laughs> yes. Now, the more land area would have to be the walkways, yeah, I guess, but you're getting so much more money and you're saving so much by using no-till that you're really mitigating uh, any loss of land. What would you say, Sorry. Right, so the, the land area itself, like you said, you are incorporating the walkways where in conventional gardening, have those walkways and you're just walking in between the rows but every just remember that everywhere that you're walking you're compacting that soil as well and so in order to try and relieve that compact then you try then you till the soil in order to break up those soils and it's kind of a, a catch-22 on that point so does it take up more land area yes it does but like James said Overall and in the long run, I think your crop production and um, your planting areas will benefit more through a no-till. How do you manage weeds that spread through rhizomes, such as mock strawberries? They cross-pollinate with my planted strawberries and now my strawberries are small and have less flavor. Well, you'd have to take care of those mock strawberries in great detail. I don't know how else to explain that. Um, isolate your, well, but this is, the, the pollen is going in the wind, I guess, and the bees are bringing them in. If, if they do, yet yeah, they do that. But I don't know how to answer that one, other than. Yeah, so really, when, you're, yeah. when you're developing your gardens, um, make sure that you kill all the weeds ahead of time. Make sure that you get rid of them all. If you have an established garden that already has, you know, a crop in there and now you're starting to get the rhizomes, the underground rhizomes that tend to grow and you have no idea where they're coming from, that can be a potential problem. But if you, ha if you know that you have mock strawberries somewhere, I would recommend that you go ahead and take them out by hand, depending on how many you have. If you have a specific area that you have more mock strawberries than you do your cash crop, you may want to use some sort of a uh, chemical or something to be able to kill all those plants because it, that chemical or, or if you're going to use a chemical, it has to be systemic, meaning that it's going to go down into the root system to kill those rhizomes before they start spreading. So something that's going to be a contact pesticide is not going to be beneficial. So something that's going to be systemic that will kill the root system, that will also work. Yeah, I was also going to talk about the chemical and you thank you for bringing that up. And it's much better if you use it in the fall because that's when the plant makes food to go into the roots, the rhizomes. So if you use it in the fall, then the, it will be translocated even better into the, into the rhizomes, into the roots down there. Okay. I recently, so this is from Abby. You recently bought property that you want to cultivate. It's currently in pasture and you're thinking about using chicken tractors to take care of the grass and seeds. Then cover with mulch or straw to be planted in next year. Would you offer further suggestions or does this sound good? So you told me you have 25 acres and I hope you're going to be working an acre here, two acres or something like that. 
what the chickens will do is just eat the tops of the grass. The grass will still be there, but there'll be lots of droppings from the chickens. That's, that's good for the, for the land. But if you're going to do the no-till, then you'll have to do one of the strategies that uh, Laurie suggested. You may want to reduce the compaction of the soil by doing an initial till, because after that you don't want to do any more till. Then you want to set up your beds, and then on the beds you'll have to bring in compost and all those organic materials. You could actually put get manure. Manure is free. People who own horses, each horse drops about 40 pounds of manure a day, and they like to give it for free. In fact, I have a horse owner here in one in the county who gives it for free and pays you to take it away because it's just too much. I mean, in 10 days, you have 400 pounds of manure from one horse. So if you can get that in the fall, by springtime, it's broken down and you're ready to plant. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, you can go that route. That, that would be a, okay, an okay route. And again, I urge you to listen to this video by this couple from California. You get lots of good directions. Laurie? Yep, I, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, when we talk about no-till, we're talking about not bringing a tiller in and not tilling up that soil. But you have to understand that sometimes, you know, even with a no-till, commercial growers that have no-till systems, at some point they run their tractors over, they slot in their seeds, you know, and they don't have walkways, right? So the commercial ag have rows and rows and rows and acres and acres of crops that may be no-till. But they also depend a lot on those cover crops. So even if the tractor is going through those fields uh, and compacting it, they plant those radishes to help combat that compaction. Uh, they plant those legumes to add that nitrogen and doing the same thing only in a smaller acreage by adding those cover crops is going to help with that. Um, but the initial tilling on something like a pasture that you're talking about is okay to do. You know, and maybe once every three or four years if you find that you're getting a lot of weed seeds depending on the size of that pasture. If you're getting a lot of weeds coming back in, you may want to retill after four years or so. You know, it's been a while. You know, till it under and then go ahead and take care of those weed seeds again and then start a no-till again. You know, it's not, it's just a matter of a mindset change from conventional to no-till. And once you get through that, the mindset change that, that I'm going to do this instead of this because this is what I, where I want to go, once you get past that, it's going to be a piece of cake. Thank you. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, using a chain harrow to overseed small grain seed works well. Thank you, Kelly. That's a suggestion right there. Yep. Yeah, thank you. And then I think we've also talked about weed, weed control strategies. You just, you know, just. Pull, pull, pull out the odd, oh, let me, let, this picture here was, is of, what is the word? Uh, it's like Queen Anne's like. Gout, gout weed. Oh, gout weed, okay. But it's having, it's going through hell with this gout weed. And I, I don't know about it that much, but I am thinking if you cover this ground with cardboard to begin with, I should suppress this. It's not that aggressive, but it's persistent. I guess I get the point. And I don't know much about it. What do you think? Uh, no, I don't, I don't know much about it either. Right, right. And no till for the small acreage farmer. That's what we talked about. And it is, yes, worth it if you do it right. The no till with hay, pros and cons, it's mainly the seed. Okay. And there's that video there. Actually, these people in California say they don't even mind the deer coming and taking a bite in there. They have plenty to eat and they just go back. They don't bother with them. They have 
they have set up an equilibrium between themselves and wildlife. How to maintain, oh, there was this question, how to maintain healthy soil without fertilizer and some composting tips. Okay, healthy soil without fertilizers. Healthy soil, remember, we talked about, I talked about what healthy soil is. And if you have healthy soil, you do not need to be adding any fertilizer. It, 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 it is regenerative in itself. You don't need to be, if you do it right, Okay, composting tips. I never seem to get the right ratio of greens to browns in my compost tumbler. And I included this slide here just to remind everyone that the best ratio is 30 of carbon to one of nitrogen. Bacteria need energy that comes from the browns, which is the carbon, not on wood, that's always carbon. So the brown leaves, the ones that have dried are for energy, whereas the nitrogen is for other physiological processes in the body of the microbe, reproduction, whatever, all those things. And the best is 30 to one. And I wish all plant materials or organic matter was 30 to one would be peachy. We'd always be taking a pound of greens and 30 pounds of browns and mixing that. But then you cannot always take that ratio because as you can see here, straw for instance has, has in itself a ratio of 40 carbons to 40. To get good decomposition you gotta take like 40 pounds and 100 pounds of nitrogen. So those ratios matter. Do you have to take a weighing scale to, no, I've never done that and I've, I, you know. I, so, do your best estimation here and see when you take newspapers, it's mainly lots of carbon in them. And so you need just a little bit of nitrogen because, okay. So, uh, no, you need a lot of nitrogen to get to the ratio of 30 to one. So you'll have to do some mathematics, okay? Very little N in newspaper, lots of carbon. So that's 560 is like 20 times uh, what the good ratio is. So you have to go 20 times. So you'd have to take like 20 times of nitrogen or greens to get your newspaper to break down. So it takes quite a while if you don't do that. So with the person who asked this question, if the decomposing material is smelling of nitrous oxide, you have too much nitrogen, you have too much of greens. Nitrous oxide is the laughing gas. You don't laugh, but it can get you to be, it's a sedative of sorts. If you get some smell, you have too much of nitrogen. If on the other hand, you're waiting forever for your stuff to break down, then you have too much of the carbon. So if you have too much of dry stuff and it's still there next year, it's just too much. It's time you increase on the greens. Just play about with, yeah, and I'm, I, I, yeah, I don't have the perfect answer for that. Just play around with the ratios there and see if you can hasten or slow down, remove the order, and, and, and have your stuff going there without smell, you, you probably be in the right uh, ratios. Just a couple more questions here. We had a question concerning the radishes. Um, and yeah. so they're called forage radishes. I put some information in the chat box. Oilseed radish cultivars are generally used. Um, there's some good information from the Michigan researchers. So Michigan State University, go ahead and, and read to them. And as far as where you can find these seeds, if you have a local FS store, they may have some seeds. Any type of a garden nursery store may have bulk seeds as well. Uh, or go online to see if you can find any. And the last question I see is that, do you recommend adding blood meal to add nitrogen? So if, if you're not familiar with blood meal, it is generally the blood of animals like cows or maybe other different types of animals. It is a nitrogen source that you can add into the garden um, and it tends to work well, just like the cottonseed meal and the 
mill organite yes. and all those. The problem I had when I used the uh, blood meal is that I would put it in the garden and I incorporate it into the soil. And the next thing I knew, my dogs were out there digging it up. <laughs> the uh, it can work, but you can have some uh, disadvantages uh, if you have pets running around and they can smell it. So that would be up to you and how you want to use that. It has another advantage though. If you have any critters that are coming to eat your plants and they smell blood, Yes. They think one of their own has been killed there, so they keep off. So it does have that side advantage as well. You run a community garden interested in how this will work for us? Lots of ideas we gave you today that you could try out. Whether they're very small gardens or the way Rolly, Rolly does a, a, a community garden. And so, again, I also do a community garden, so, but I have not, I've never thought of no-till, so. Uh, but I can see it working pretty good. Does no-till require extra pesticide use? No. If you're doing things right, no. Those plants are healthy because they are vigorous and they can withstand any insect pests or no, most insect pests. And they can also withstand most diseases, at least the common ones. And for people that want manure, manure is, is shared and that's a website you can go to and see who is registered there and want to give away their manure. And I think beyond that, it's uh, please don't, don't, don't fail to write to us if you have a question. Um, thank you also for sending most of your questions ahead of time so that we can prepare ourselves that always helps and mine is to thank you all especially all of you that have hung on yet we still have 18 people and uh, Rory yep uh, I think that's it uh, we don't have any more questions in the chat box like James said give us a call or email us and we will be happy to work with you on anything that you have concerning no-till so I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and again, the information will be sent to you once it is published. I hope you got some good information that you can use. And again, remember, it's just a change of the mind and how you're going to do things in the garden to be able to create the type of garden that you're looking for. So think about no-till when you do that. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day. And, and we sent you an evaluation that we'd like for you to fill out and send back to us so that we know how to do this better next time. Thank you so very much. Bye.